Hello and welcome to another comedian's interview for my blog and podcast, A Rich Comic Life. My name is Richard Gill and my blog describes my experiences of watching over 800 comedians and counting over the last 46 years. I am honoured to be talking today to a very, very special guest. It's the comedy legend, Mr. Barry Cryer, OBE. Yay! Hello. Hello. How are you? I never mentioned OBE, incidentally. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Of the British Empire. What British Empire? <laughs> and people say, well, why didn't you hand it back? <laughs> and say it suggests a rejection of the people who recommended me for it. I wouldn't do that. So it's in a box at home. Lovely. And Spike Milligan said it should be Order of Milton Keynes. That <laughs> still exists. <laughs> <laughs> That's genius. <laughs> but it's very chubby. Uh, you know, why didn't you hand it back? Because I was very touched when I first got it. Right. And then I thought, what British Empire? <laughs> you know, that's all going on at the moment, isn't it? People it saying is. that. Anyway, I'll just stop waffling. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I am, I am so delighted to be chatting to you today. Um, we're going to, I'm going to talk going to talk about your illustrious comedy career. Oh. And we're going to go way back to the start. Uh, did you watch a lot of comedy growing up in the north of England? When you say watch, do you mean television? On the television, yeah. We didn't have a television set. Wow. My dad died when I was five. Right. To this day, I am jealous and envious when people say my father. And I hardly remember the man. Right. So my brother, John, was in the Merchant Navy away from home, yeah. came home, went down to London to be a civil servant, the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries. It was me and my mother. We listened to the wireless, the radio. We didn't have a television. No. When the coronation came, 1953, the Mooney family over the road were the only uh, people in our little, uh, it was a cul-de-sac where I lived in Leeds. They were the only ones with the television set. Wow. And they invited us all in to watch the coronation. It's wow. another world, isn't it? And you drew the curtains. You sat in a dark room when you watched television. And I, I always remember that. But I didn't watch television in those days. We hadn't got one. So it was the wireless, the, the radio. The radio comedy. There must have been some amazing comedians listening to there. Well, there was Itmar, I-T-M-A, It's That Man Again. Yeah. And that was originally about Hitler. Right. And then the great Ted Kavanagh, uh, the scriptwriter who became a producer and agent and everything, he created Itmar, starring Tommy Handley, the comedian. Wow. And we all listened to that. And looking back, there were three giant figures in those days, Winston Churchill, J.B. Priestley, the writer who did postscripts on the radio, and Tommy Handley, the comedian. You yeah. couldn't make it up. And the, the whole nation was listening to Tommy Handley, this comedian, I think it was Sunday night or whatever. He was one of the massive figures in those days it's amazing looking back incredible absolutely amazing so um can you describe for me please your first ever gig as a comedian because you grew up in leeds and uh you be you became a comedian there didn't you well i've, I've been at leeds university right briefly i'm ba inlet failed of leeds university oh. <laughs> Never because I was in the bar and chasing girls. I own up to this. And uh, my university career was very short. And uh, But I was in the student show, Rag Review for Charity at the Empire Theatre in Leeds. Right. And uh, I produced it and wrote it and everything. And I, on the stage, telling some jokes. And the following year, 
the guy who was supposed to produce it and write it oh boy i've forgotten his name now i do apologize if he's watching and uh, they got me back but i was no longer at the university but i uh did the show and i produced it and i told some jokes and a man came up to leeds to watch somebody not me and saw me on the stage telling jokes and offered me work wow in the right place at the right time you can't make this up <laughs> and stanley and michael joseph the two men who ran the city varieties theater in leeds where they did the television show the good old days sure they saw me and my first ever professional job was in my hometown at the city varieties theater in leeds bottom of bill and in those days television was taking over so the variety theatres, the musicals, were losing their audience. And uh, they thought, uh, what are we going to do? Because people were staying at home watching television. They weren't going to the theatre. So they thought, strippers. <laughs> they then lost the family audience. So my first ever job was in my hometown, bottom of the bill, with an older comic, and bless him, he was very good to me, and strippers and then i'd go home every night for supper my dad had died and he wasn't there right and it was me and my mum and she never asked me how has that gone she was horrified i was appearing at the city varieties with a load of strippers <laughs> so she never asked me how it had gone so i accepted that and uh I'd given up by that time and that she would ever, I heard later on, she said to my aunties, he was very good, but I thought, no, she's never coming, so forget it. <laughs> on the Saturday, we had a matinee and a woman in the box office said, come here, come here. Was that your mother last night? And I said, was what my mother last night? <laughs> my mother was quite small. She said, there was a, a little woman with a rain hat on who came up to me and said, what time's Barry Cryer on? Wow. In about 10 minutes, love. <laughs> said, Can I buy a ticket? She said, no, you can't, you're going in. And there was a commissionaire, a man with an elaborate uniform and everything. He took my mother, I'm not making this up. <laughs> he took my mother in and showed her to a seat. Wow. And she didn't sit down. She stood at the back and watched me and then fled into the night. And I got home that night, Saturday, and I said to my mother, you, you came last night, didn't you? She said, yes, yes. And I waited for the comment. She said, the suit looked nice. <laughs> I couldn't believe her boy had been in a sh No decent woman went into that <laughs> theater in those uh, strippers. <laughs> He didn't show with strippers. It's amazing <laughs> looking back, but it's, it's that true. That is wonderful. What a great story. It still looked nice. <laughs> that was my first critique from my mother. <laughs> um, uh, you, you chose to focus mainly on comedy writing. How, how did that come about? I didn't focus on anything. I just went with the flow in my life. Right. I had a half-baked idea of being a journalist. Right. Not a scriptwriter or a show business or anything. Right. I, I felt it for writing. And uh, when I was at university, I think it was, I got an interview with Sir Linton Andrews of the Yorkshire Post. Right. And I, oh boy, and I went for an interview with him. And he said, we want people who are brand new or people have been out and about doing other stuff you're stuck somewhere in the middle so i walked away i'd, I'd failed uh, my first attempt at being a journalist oh dear. what i told you it all started happening because yeah. a man came up to leeds to see somebody else and saw me in the student show and one thing led to another and i started getting the odd job with strippers <laughs> <laughs> and then went back to leeds and it's all over and then uh, I went to the Empire Theatre in Leeds. Johnny Gunn, the stage manager, remembered me as a student. And I went to see Johnny and he gave me a job as a stagehand. And in the morning, 
um, you would empty the bars of the, of the empties, the stalls in the circle. You do that, then go home, have a nap and a rest, and then come back and work as, work as a stagehand at night. Wow. And wow. so, of course, the people I saw working there, that must have been amazing. Been One of my idols who I'd heard on the radio, Max Wall. Oh, the yes. Comedian. It was wonderfully visual, but he was a big radio star because he had a great voice. Yeah. And all these people I saw, Billy Eckstein, yeah. a big American star appeared. And after the band call, the, uh, the rehearsal on the Monday morning, I found myself chatting to this American star. He was an American in Leeds. And he said, come on, kid. And we went for a walk around Leeds and everybody's looking. It's Billy Eckstein, who was that little oik with, <laughs> with the lead people I met, you know. And John was marvellous to me. He was an early mentor for me. Yeah, yeah. And Max Wall, who looked wonderful. And he did Professor Wolofsky with his tights and <laughs> snuggling about the stage. And uh, he would come over to the side during his act in front of the audience and say, how long, John? Meaning, do you want me to get off now or carry on a bit? Right. I've been standing there with Johnny Gunn and Johnny Gunn would say, keep going, Max. Or leave it, Max. <laughs> Max was stop his act and works the end. What? Johnny Gunn had said, leave it, Max. These people I met in those days, I can't believe it looking back. I was so lucky. Absolutely incredible. I mean, I mean, you, you, your, the, the experience of being there must have, just being there must have been extraordinary because you'd seen all these great acts. Yes, I'd been in the atmosphere. And then David Nixon, who was a big star on television in those days. Yeah. And uh, he was going to do pantomime. Sure. And he was in uh, Cinderella. And dear David was bald, so he wore a little hat as <laughs> buttons. He said, I don't want to frighten the children. <laughs> but he drove up to Leeds to do the pantomime. And his wife who was in the pantomime drove up separately and she crashed her car oh dear and died oh dear me and david drove past the crash and didn't recognize it wow. and he arrived in leeds and they told him and he collapsed oh. and he then said i'm doing the pantomime for her wow i think it was jean telfer uh, actress and singer and everything, she came up to replace David. I was now with the lads in the stage crew. They took the out of me because I'd been at university and they, ooh, he's the tough. <laughs> <laughs> and Leo Lyon, the manager, I'm not making his name up, called me in and he said, you are now going to look after Mr. Nixon. And I was his assistant in the dressing room and put the two rabbits, Bill and Ben, in, concealed in the table, oh dear. And we became <laughs> friends, David Nixon, he was right. a mentor of mine, and he was marvelous to me. And we did a matinee in an evening, and he'd have a nap between the matinee and the evening. And I would stand guard on the door, the man's having his sleep. And Bernard Delphon, later Lord Delphon, yeah doing a tour of the country, popping in to see all the pantomimes. And I'm standing guard on the door, David's having his nap, and I knew who this man was coming down the corridor. Oh my, it's Bella Delphon. Is Mr. Nixon in? And I heard my voice saying, I'm sorry, he's having a nap. And this man, Bernard Delphon, said, good boy. <laughs> Way. I really re respected him for that. He thought this brilliant. Young was doing his job. That's brilliant. And we met later on, Bernard Delphont and I picked the names up as I dropped them. <laughs> it's perfect. And I reminded him of that and we were just laughing and talking about it. That's the fantastic. The people I met, 
you know, I'm a people person. Yeah, 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 very much. If so. I have a regret, it's travel. I haven't seen enough of this planet I live on. Right. But having said that, I've had the most fantastic life with people. It's been unbelievable. The people I met. Extraordinary. Absolutely yeah. extraordinary. Um, let's move on to the to the people to the um, comedy acts that you've written for. You've you've famously written for many of the comic greats. Um, Morecambe and Wise are the reason why I personally love comedy. That's why this blog is here. Um, but unfortunately, I never did get to see them live. Um, tell me what it was like, please, working with them. Well, I'd seen them live before I ever wrote for them. Wow. And met them. Right. And so that was a good entree. Yeah. And John Junkin and I wrote for them. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And uh, they'd been on ITV with Sid Green and Dick Hills. And then the great Bill Cotton of the BBC signed them up for the BBC. That's right, yeah. And uh, they came over, obviously. And uh, Bill saw who could write for them. He didn't think of me and John. Eddie Braben, brilliant writer, yeah. had fallen out with Ken Dodd over money, strangely enough. <laughs> because Donnie was taking after writing money. And, you know, anyway. So, uh, Eddie Braben was signed up, but John Junkin and I were writing for Eric and Ernie. And, uh, oh, Eddie, I used to annoy John Junkin by referring to Eddie Braben as the A-team. He's the man, I said. He's turning them into Eric and Ernie, not more than wise. Yeah, yeah. John Junkin got really pissed off with this. <laughs> and Eddie Braben heard about this, that I've been saying this about him. And we finally met up in a bar somewhere. And Eddie grabbed hold of me and pointed at me and said to people, famous Morecambe and Rise writer. <laughs> and Eddie and I became friends. And it was marvelous. John and I wrote uh, uh, old Christmas shows for Eric and Ernie. Wow. And, uh, wow. and then we went to, uh, Eric and Ernie went to ITV, Thames Television. And Eddie was still tied up with the BBC. So John and I, immodestly, we we wrote shows for them at Thames until Eddie came over. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm sorry, I think we did. The received impression in the press was, oh, Eric and Ernie, ITV, it's not the same, is it? But, they were still bad. No, we did some rather good stuff. We did Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with Judy Dench. That, that was bad. Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> with Donald Sindon and... But Eddie and I became friends, so that was that was good. I've got I've got all the Morecambe and Wise books behind me, and I've got um, Eddie Braben's book is phenomenal. It it, it must have been extraordinary um, mm. uh, um, delivering scripts to Morecambe and Wise, and then having that meeting for you all to decide what was funny. I'll tell you something about Eric and Ernie. I'd got to know them right. before, as I said, before I even wrote for yes, them. Yes, yeah. And uh, there was a little bit where uh, Eric was talking to the camera two or three minutes and then Ernie came in and I wrote that bit. And it was, you know, it was on a bit of paper. <laughs> and I went in to give it to Eric and it was there. he was there with a the choreographer and all the other people. And he looked at it and in front of everybody, he said, you weren't listening, this is wrong. Right. Have another go. Oh, so I walked away sulking and I went to the bar and I was, Ugh. And uh, Eric walked in, he said, why the long face? I said, you've just taken it out of me in front of everybody. He said, that was there, this is here, what are you drinking? Wow. He separated work and friendship i never forgot that that's amazing no, no that was just me yeah. about the script what are you drinking i never forgot that he appears to be of all the comedians that i've read about and seen he appears to be like that in real life as opposed to on on stage could he you... had an amazing life yeah. off stage he was a bird watcher of fishermen 
a family man. He, he did the lot. Yeah, yeah. And dear Ernie and Doreen had their boat. They were very different men. Yeah. So whenever they got together at rehearsals, they never stopped. Chat, chat, chat. What you been doing? What you been doing? They didn't live in each other's pockets when they weren't working. It was fascinating. Brilliant. And yet one needed one needed the other. Definitely. Oh yes. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, when Eric had his heart, yeah. Said, my wife and I went to uh, British Heart Foundation, whatever. And Ernie wasn't there, but Eric was. Right. And of course, Eric had been asked to speak. And it isn't what he did. He didn't do after dinners and speaking. And he wanted Ernie there with him and this, that and the other. And uh, he said, oh, God, I'm speaking tonight. And he stood up to speak, but he riffed off me. Wow. I was there, so he could have a go at me. Oh, look at his face. Oh, wow. what are you doing? God. Fascinating these people. Oh, amazing! I would, I would, I would have so loved to have met them or even seen them live. Um, <coughs> the the first um, comedian I did see. Can live. I do a shocking moment? Oh yes, please carry Man on. A cigarette. Man oh, no, it's fine. Cigarette. Whatever you want to do, it's fine. We are, we are we um, are videoing this, as you know, but that's absolutely fine. Um, the first comedian I did see was Les Dawson, who starred in my first ever comedy show that I saw on holiday in Scarborough in 1975, and I was aged eight. A year later, I saw Tommy Cooper and was hooked. Um, describe what it was like writing scripts for these comic greats, please. Oh, how long have you got? <laughs> this was a wonderful wordsmith. Yeah. Uh, the words poured out of it is brilliant. And uh, David Renwick and I, I think, that Les used to do a, a sort of long monologue pouring the words out. And he said, oh boy, I'm knackered. I'm, could you have a go at these? So we tried to imitate his style. And we did our best, but it was never quite the same. His passion was writing. Yeah his heart towards the end uh, Les was writing away he had books and everything and he was at home writing and that was the man he was a wordsmith he was absolutely brilliant there's the there's the famous story about um, him elongating what it was like looking up at the sky and and and, and then he said that and by god the toilet roof needs lacking <laughs> yes <that's right. laughs> there was always you a, twist a wonderful punchline at the end yeah <laughs> and he told me once that when he was struggling trying to make his way up he's playing the back room of pubs and everything and he said one night he said i was having a really oh boy not getting any laughs and he said i paused and a voice in the audience said there used to be a pool table in here <laughs> He was one of my... You know, these people, had, Eric and Ernie and Les, by the time they made it on television, they'd done their apprenticeship. These people didn't appear from nowhere. They'd worked hard. They'd been there. That's what I respected about them. Yeah, sure, yeah. Of, of course, yeah. They, 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 they worked for years in the music halls before television came along. Yes. Yeah. And Eric and Ernest's first series, Running Wild or whatever, the BBC was a flop. Yeah. And uh, a critic wrote TV, the box they buried Eric and Ernie in. And Eric took that cutting in his wallet the rest of his life. That's amazing. In the sense of a portion. And then they came back and it all started happening, you know. And uh, yeah. it was fascinating. But I was. I was so lucky, but I'd met them before I ever wrote for them. That's wonderful. So when they got together, they didn't live in each other's pockets. They gossiped and gossiped away. At, at really what have you been doing? What have you been doing? It was fascinating. Yeah. Oh, and Harold Wilson did a show. I remember that. And he was in the flat, and John Junkin and I wrote this one. And I always remember, he was so respectful, <laughs> former Prime Minister. And uh, we got this plot that he would be in the flat, but he kept telling jokes, Harold Wilson. And Ernie was loving it, and Eric was furious, fuming. <laughs> you know, this man's coming here telling jokes, and it really worked. It was great. 
But Harold Wilson said to us one day, very respectfully, I think he said, well, I've thought of a line I could do here. <laughs> said, what? And we thought, oh, this is embarrassing. You know, if we don't like it, we'll have to accept it. It's Harold Wilson, oh dear. And he said, I thought I'd say here, I thought of this while waiting for a laugh at the Brighton Conference. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. That was Harold Wilson. He wrote that line. And Eric said, that bloody good. <laughs> <laughs> that is magical. You, like, yeah, you know, it's amazing. Mag absolutely magic. When, when I saw uh, Tommy Cooper on stage, um, I can remember at such an early age, the curtains opened up and that he was lying on a bed and nothing else was on stage. It was just a bed with him lying on it. And one woman in the crowd started laughing and it trickled right round. So everybody was laughing for about five minutes and he hadn't done a thing. And he popped his head up and he just looked at the audience. And he said, what, has somebody come on? And everybody laughed even more. Who else could do that? And the audience laughed. Exactly. Somebody that reminded me recently, uh, there was dramatic music and Tommy got a sheet and covered himself. Da -da 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 and then, big climax, he whipped the sheet away and he'd stepped out of his shoes. <laughs> now, you think, is that funny? It was when he did it. It was extraordinary. But some nights the music would play and he wouldn't come on. Right. He was trapped in his dressing room. He wasn't. <laughs> He was behind the curtains with a microphone. Oh, I can't let the door open. I can't. <laughs> oh. He was getting last before he even came on. Uh, it's an extraordinary... Um, it's another uh, level, isn't it? I'm sure you? I worked on. There was a pedal bin already on the stage. Pedal bin. <laughs> Tommy walked on. Uh, 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 and he suddenly saw this. And he was like a child. See, yeah. what's that? What's that? <laughs> And he pressed the pedal and the lid on. Oh, uh, that's all it was. And then he woke up with his back to it, pressed the pedal with his back to it. Oh, oh. <laughs> and Eric Morgan told me the uh, Golden Garter Club, I think, in Manchester, it was yeah. going to be Tommy. And there was a few of them around in the area at the time, the younger Des O'Connor and everything. And Eric rang the gang and said let's go and see Tommy on Friday night so about four tables of people turned up to see Tommy that night and Eric said oh this is great he said Tommy had started his act and it wasn't set up it was genuine apparently a waiter walked in front of him with a tray of drinks and dropped the tray with a crash wow. and it, Eric said Four tables of us leaned forward. What's Tommy going to say now? <laughs> and Tommy looked down and said, that's nice. <laughs> and he got a big laugh. <laughs> and Eric said, that was brilliant. He wasn't <laughs> thinking of some great funny line. No. <laughs> it was just Tommy Cooper saying, that's nice. <laughs> now, brilliant. That's wonderful. And Tommy couldn't learn lines. He was <laughs> terrible memorizing a script. So we got this repertory company, Henry McGee and Peter Reeves and uh, Clarissa Newcomb and people who worked with him. Yeah. When he wandered off during a script, they'd bring him back in again. You know, <laughs> where are we in the plot of this? He was a one-off, he was oh, amazing. He was extraordinary, absolutely. I love this story, he said, uh, I heard this after Tommy left us, bless him. He said, I'm standing in a queue at a post office and a man in front of me is holding a banana up like that. No, like that. Like <laughs> that. I said, why are you holding that banana up? And he looked and he said, oh no, I've eaten my gun. <laughs> <laughs> Only Tommy. Classic you could see a joke he was going to do on the page and think, that's not that funny. <laughs> no, when he did it, he couldn't analyse this. No, no, no. No, and and I think that's the These magic of it. You couldn't say somebody was a a sort of Tommy Cooper. There yeah. was only one. Yeah, yeah. Only one Les Dawson. Yeah. There were only two Eric and Ernie's. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. And I'm um, not knocking the current generation. No, no, no. Every generation has brilliant people. I'm just talking about people I work with. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. And also, as you go on, I had idols like Frank Muir and Dennis Norden, who oh, wrote actually. Radio, Take It From Here, and uh, Ray Galton and Alan Simpson, who are only a few years older than me, Hancock and Steptoe. They treated me as a fellow writer. They didn't patronize me. I wasn't this hoi who'd written for David Frost or something. They treated you as a mate. I never forgot that. And I hope I've been the same with younger ones I've worked with. You know, very, every very generation's so, yeah. got brilliant people. They're different, obviously, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, very, very much so. And I, and I think that comes across in your work as well, because what you're brilliant obviously at doing is tailor, tailoring your writing to the specific comedian. That's the word. I used to say this were like tailors. Yeah. We're making a suit. Yeah. Then John Junkin and I, uh, there's a sitter and a walker. I've talked to other writers about this. I always wrote in partnership after the nightclub days. Yeah. And one of you is sitting there scribbling or typing and the other one's walking around. John Junkin would walk around the room, twiddling his glasses, being Eric Morecambe. Wow. You've got to see them in your mind's eye. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah. same thing differently for somebody else, but this is Eric and Ernie. Yeah, yeah. You've got to see them and hear them. And you said tailoring, it yeah. is. Yeah. You're like tailors. Yeah. But I always worked in partnership. The great Eddie Braben, he said to me once, you know, he went mad, he was exhausted to be battling his typewriter all night. He had to keep better you know, in the I, I had to work with somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was very fortunate to be in the audience for the recording of the two Ronnie sketchbook in 2005. Um, you also wrote many of their successful shows Tell me about writing for them. Were you, were you specific for writing for each of them or did you do sketches for both of well, them? I knew Ronnie Corbett anyway. We yeah. worked in nightclubs. I met Ronnie when we were in Danny LaRue's uh, nightclub shows. Danny was a big star in those days. So I knew Ronnie anyway. Then I was in my hometown uh, in Leeds and Stanley Baxter, who I'd written for, yeah. was doing um, a stage show. He'd done the TV on the bright side and his stage show was on the brighter side. And Ronnie Barker was in it. I always remember this and I was talking to Stanley and he said to me, watch out for this fat one, he's going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ronnie Barker was in the Navy Lark on the radio and everything and suddenly people were going, who's this? Yeah. And then the chemistry between those two men when they finally got together, you know, they were in the Frost Report originally with John Cleese. Yeah. And they were known as the two Ronnies then to all of us, obviously. And then all sorts of things happened and then they got their own series, the two Ronnies. And it was fascinating, but it was great. It was like Eric and Ernie, I'd known them before by the time you wrote for them. So you had a sort of rapport with them, I hope, you know. Yes, yeah. And the first thing they ever did uh, together on, it was written by uh, Mike Palin and Terry Jones. It was a police station sketch. And uh, one of us behind well. that, <laughs> and says, oh, morning, super. And the other one says, hello, wonderful. <laughs> And Mike Pelley has talked about this. They didn't use the rest of the sketch. They so just used those two opening lines. Wow. They got a big laugh. It's intangible, this. You can't define it. What's going to work? I was I was very fortunate to, to meet uh, Ronnie Corbett uh, after, sadly, Ronnie Barker's death. And he said to me that, that, that he thought the major difference, obviously, was one was a comedy actor and the other one was a comedian. That's right. 
but, but Ronnie Barker nobody was the, could realise uh, the chemistry until they came together. Yeah, what Ronnie Barker was the comic actor. Yeah, yeah. And Ronnie Corbett was the comedian. And if you watch now, you can watch the two Ronnies. And what's fascinating is some of the sketches seem a bit too long and it's a bit over elaborate, it's a different... The one thing that doesn't date, I think, is Ronnie Corbett in the chair. Yeah, very much so. They, they brought that back in the 90s, didn't they, on Ben Elton's show, because it was such a That's success. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And Spike Mullins, the writer, used to write those. Right. But Spike used to ring me up and say, give me a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd give him a joke, and then he'd write all the way around it for Ronnie Corbett, waffling away before he told a joke. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, amazing era, that. Oh, it was extraordinary. Um, there is a section in my blog called The Ones That Got Away, which details other comedians that, alas, I did not get to see. Most notably, Bob Monkhouse, Dave Allen, Frankie Howard. Again, you wrote for all these. It must have been an extraordinary uh, variety of comedians that around well, Bob, in those days. Bob said to me once that to uh, younger people who was the smarmy game show host because he did more game shows than anybody else on television and he'd been a writer he was a cartoonist he was an amazing man but he said i understand this generation just think oh it's the game show guy not he's not a comedian i think it's and so unfair so when you saw bob live yeah he was so blue, you could be quite <laughs> busy. I'm enjoying myself now, it's not what I do on telly, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and his last appearance... Oh, uh, that was extraordinary. Uh, that was extraordinary. Uh, the young ones came to see him. And I don't think they'd known how... Yeah. This man was, what a stand-up he was. Yeah, his yeah, he's timing and his command of it. Yeah. And John Colshaw, my mate, I was in the audience and he said, you know, watching this man in action, you can see that younger audience are going, oh boy, we didn't know he was like this. Yeah. Was was, intrigued. Oh, Bob Monkhouse must go and see that. <laughs> oh was, boy, was, that man. It was wonderful to see uh, Mikey Arwood as well on that, making an yes. appearance. Yeah. Ah, and what was interesting was Bob brought Mike on, and it was all about Mike, wasn't it? Yeah, wasn't yeah, it was in, Bob? yeah. He would yeah. feed and drawing Mike out. Yeah. And I did it with Mike on uh, BBC and ITV. Right. Mike said to me once, bless him, I'm still in touch. Uh, he said, I was playing Harold Wilson on the radio. <laughs> and uh, Mike and I were talking once, and he said, do oh, I heard you doing that. I said, you should be doing that for heaven's sake i'm lucky <laughs> doing it. and he said oh this is true he said my voices aren't that good if you close your eyes oh i'm good at faces and body language i said you what that's he was convinced that he wasn't right for radio wow what that's incredible eric he, sykes he was... said to me once you do a lot of radio don't you i said yeah I'm, look I don't. I said, why not? He said, have you heard my voice? It's awful. Oh. These people are amazing. Incredible. Talking about themselves. Well, he he was the first impressionist on TV and on radio. Well, not so much on radio, Super. like you say, but certainly on TV. He was massive. Oh, these, uh, that era, mm. BBC was ruling. Mm. Mates who work for ITV, so we're in despair at the weekend. <laughs> yeah, of course, you know, yeah. Eric and Ernie and Dave Allen and oh, you know, it was all two Ronnies. It was, they were crucifying IT. <laughs> <laughs> BBC ruled. Oh yeah, on a Saturday night, it was extraordinary. Um, you also co-wrote the Kenny Everett television show with Ray Cameron, yeah. who was Michael McIntyre's dad. That's right. And it was obviously one of the most successful modern comics. What is impressive about your career, like you said before, is your love for modern comedy. What do you think makes a great comedian? Oh, I don't know. It's just, 
they're not <laughs> drugs, they're originals. I think so, yeah. funny yeah. bones, you can't analyse it. There's an indefinable element in great comedians, and you you can't analyse it. You just think, yeah. no, you're funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's it. Good. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> it. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, it's the X factor. It's a yeah, yeah. thing you've got and you can't analyse it. You don't want to, really. No, no, that's, that's the magic, I think, yeah. Um, let's move on to the to the Edinburgh Festival. Um, I, I am, my home city is Carlisle, but I've lived in London for 30 years. Um, but I go up to Edinburgh. I've been fortunate to go to Edinburgh, to the Edinburgh Fringe since 2005. And I always make a point of seeing your show when you're on at the Gilded Balloon with, with oh, you're the one. <laughs> Bonnie Goulton. Um, can you tell me what your, can you describe what your first Edinburgh Fringe was like? What year did you go up? What did you think of it? I think the first, I could be wrong, Colin Sell, my old mate and I played the Assembly Rooms in uh, Edinburgh. Yeah. And we thought, oh boy, what's this going to be like? And uh, yes, it was it was interesting because I was with my mate. We were the double act, and subsequently I did it on my own. And then I did it with Willie Rushton, and uh, and then Ronnie Golden, yeah. my mate. I did it for year after year. But I'm so lucky these partners, these rocks. I worked with Colin at the piano, Colin at the piano, and Willie Rushton yeah. and. Ronnie Golden. I was, I've always liked that double act thing, really. I didn't like doing it on my own. You feel stranded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the, the mate there. You bounce off each other. What is what is brilliant about Ronnie Golden was he is that he plays the guitar so you could get songs in. And I always remember Peace and Quiet being a particular favourite that you'd both Oh, sing. yes, and it got louder and louder. Yeah. <laughs> and Sean Locke came to see us one night. Yeah. And I introduced it very seriously, <laughs> and we started singing. And there wasn't any, there were no jokes in the lyric. It was completely straight and serious. And Sean said to me afterwards, he said, I thought, oh, this is embarrassing. What are they on about? And he said, it took me about two or three courses to get the joke. Because it was louder and louder, as you know, we were probably bellowing it at the end. Please have quiet. <laughs> Genius. Oh, it's, I'm so lucky the people I work with, you know, they're it's... so different. Willie Rushton and I. Yes, dear Willie. All the shows together. And we, were, we were and we weren't a double act. I would walk on and he would walk off and vice versa. <laughs> we were together at the beginning of the show and together at the end. And it was it was a joy working with him. Yeah, yeah. He was and so where happy. I'm sitting now in Hatch End, the Elliot Hall, we played the Elliot Hall. Willie was now really loving it. And he'd be on the stage doing his solo bit. And I said, you're turning into Doddy, because it got longer and longer. And uh, I lived three minutes away from the Elliot Hall where yeah. we're doing the show. And Willie said, oh, Basser, he said, you could pop home for a drink at the interval. <laughs> I said, Willie, I could pop home for a drink while you're on. <laughs> Brilliant. That's brilliant. Big people. Um, you say about um, working with uh, other people at the Edinburgh Fringe and, and uh, um, writing. Um, uh, I specifically remember a solo show that you did at the, at the Gilded Balloon called The Elephant in the Room. And it was you rattling off stories, wonderful stories doing like an A to Z of all the comedians That's you wrote right. for. I did it on my own to yeah, start. Yeah. Uh, a to Z. I got, I admit it, I'd seen Ned Sherin do that. Right. A to Z. So the first time I did it, it was solo. And uh, my friend Steve Ollathorne yeah. had done 26 slides to accompany every letter of the alphabet. Wow. And on the first okay. night, I got to letter D. <laughs> and he said, thank you very much. 22 slides, forget it. And I was getting to Z by the end of the week. <laughs> At the time I done, I thought, no. So it was with Colin then. Your and course, he put yeah. it in the back of cards, A to Z. And we'd ask the audience to shout out a letter. 
they all shouted out Z and H, you know, to see what I'd do. Yeah. <laughs> and God would hand me the relevant card. So the show basically was different every time. The audience were involved. Right. Yes, of yeah, course. Involved, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, over the years, when I've seen you live, you have told some of my favourite jokes. I particularly, I particularly love the parrot joke. Um, how do you remember all your jokes and routines? Well, you, they're all in your head, scrambled up somewhere. And I make connections. Somebody yes. says something, you know, that reminds me. So they're all in your brain somewhere and you hope they tumble out at the appropriate moment. The parrot joke, the definitive one. Yeah. I've been doing parrot jokes ever since. I've become identified with them. A woman saw a beautiful blue and gold parrot displayed in a window, whatever, and she went into the shop and said, God, he's gorgeous, beautiful. She said, how much? And the man said, uh, 20 quid. She said, 20 pounds? He's beautiful. And the man said, well, I've got to be honest, he's got form, he's got history. He was in a brothel. And to put it delicately, his language is quite colourful. And she said, 20 pounds, I'll take a chance on that. And she took the parrot back to her flat and took the cover off. And the parrot looked around and said, new place, very nice. Oh, they, they, sorry, the man had said he was in a brothel. You see, I'm forgetting the detail now. He was in a brothel. This is crucial. <laughs> So the pair looked round, first side of her flat, and said, new place, very nice. And the two daughters walked in, and the pair said, new place, new girls, very nice indeed. And her husband walked in, and the pair said, hello, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> but I did then, I forgot girl. to say the brothel at the beginning. <laughs> it is such a great line. Thank you so much for telling that. <laughs> um, you have appeared on TV and radio many times, most notably in the 60s with Joker's Wild, which I yeah. I can just remember watching. Can I just say something now? Yeah. Can I have a pee break? Uh, <laughs> no. We will be done in about 10 minutes. Can you hold on or not? Okay, we'll do 10 minutes. Is that all right? Yeah, I've literally That's got... That's an expression of anguish on my face. <laughs> and we will be... Have got a bucket? <laughs> <laughs> um, you've appeared on TV and radio many times, most notably in the 60s with Jokers Wild, and as a regular panellist on BBC Radio 4's I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue since 1972, which I'm a big fan and I've seen live on stage. Please yeah. tell me how these came about. Oh, Jokers Wild. Can't remember how that happened because that was with Ray Cameron and we subsequently went on to do the Kenny Everett's. Yes, yeah. I can't remember the origin of that. I must have done... Somebody suggested get a load of comics on interrupting each other and... <laughs> you know, and that's... It was shamefully set up beforehand. We'd say, yeah, all right, you do that one. And then you butt in with that one and everything. And there was a marvelous man called Fred Emney, very large character. And Jack Douglas, the comedian, oh, being by Joe Baker, yeah. uh, set up who interrupts who. <laughs> and Jack Douglas started telling a joke and suddenly there was a buzz and we hadn't set up that and I thought, oh, interruption by Fred Emney. I thought, what? And Fred Emney said, is this about the seaside? And I <laughs> said, yes. He said, I live at Bognor Regis. Just thought I'd mention it. <laughs> and, the and the comics laughed and laughed and the audience were bewildered. What happened there? It was amazing the things that happened on that show. It was a joy. It was wonderful. Tell me about I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, because you've been a panellist on that since it started. Well, this very day, as I'm talking to you, I was listening to I'm Sorry I'll Read That Again, which was devised by Graham Garden and Bill Oddie and Tim Brooke Taylor. Sure. And then uh, the BBC wanted a follow-up. 
And Graham thought, what are we going to do? We don't want a show that's heavily scripted now. What? What? It was brilliant, his formula. He thought, a show that doesn't have a script, it has a format. It does this, 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 and then you've all got to prepare and cope with that. And that was 1972, for heaven's sake. And somebody at the BBC said, Humphrey Littleton, chairman, he'd only done jazz on the radio. And the <laughs> other said, are you serious? And of course, it was a brilliant choice. Oh, and absolutely. The first series, he couldn't do two of the recordings, and I, I would deputise for him. That was all. I was just the understudy. Right. And then uh, we set off, and I became a member of the team. Wow. Incredible. Just and think John Cleese and Joe Kendall and Bill Oddie were involved in the early days, and, oh, don't like this, no script. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what we were going to do and Willie Rushton was brought in and oh boy that was it absolutely fantastic can't believe it 1972 uh, well, was it was a great Littleton and Jack D does a brilliant job oh yeah he said very modestly I can't fill those shoes I'll just try and do the job you know exactly exactly yeah yeah absolutely amazing career um just just for a last question what do you think has been the highlight of your illustrious career meeting my wife oh that's fantastic nothing to do, nothing to do with work at all i met dear tez she'd been in a pantomime and she was danny larue said what are you doing after pantomime she said not much and there was a nightclub rehearsal and i thought who's that standing next to the pianist Ooh. <laughs> went on from there and the result is our family that's amazing that's the best thing ever happened to me you could the right place in the right time that is just just a fantastic end to a wonderful chat thank you so so much for oh, your it's time been a pleasure. i do go on don't i no no, no no i could i could talk to you all night i really could it's been an absolute honor well it's mutual pleasure. thank you very much same time tomorrow <laughs> all the best all the very best to you and thanks again all the very best thank you thank you, you.